Hi everybody, um, good afternoon and thank you very much for joining us uh, near the end of what I think has been a very busy week for lots of people. Um, my name is Erica Hope and I'm the Director for Climate Planning Indoors at the European Climate Foundation and I will be your moderator for today's discussion about how we plan for and measure progress towards climate neutrality. Um, and before anything else, I just need to make sure you know that this session is being recorded. I think we all just got told by a machine, but um, just, just to be sure. Um, so it's actually a very appropriate day, I think, to be having this event, uh, because as you surely have seen, uh, the European climate law has been officially adopted today by the European Parliament. Um, and we are honoured today to have um, three panellists uh, uh, who've been uh, very involved in different ways in, in shaping it. And of course, I'm mentioning the climate law here because it is the law that enshrines climate neutrality or net zero as the overarching goal that EU policymaking needs to be focused around and in a sense worked back from. And I think uh, many of us here on the call today would uh, probably agree that winning that this this goal at EU level and also in many member states uh, at national level has been a major step forward in policymaking. And so, uh, in related terms, has been the concept of doing long-term planning, because preparing long-term strategies at the EU level, the national level, and the local level really gives us an understanding of uh, what needs to happen in all sectors and between sectors uh, in order to get on track for climate neutrality. And some of these actions will be things that we can see directly now, so, for example, installing more, installing more and more renewable energy capacity uh, or um, shifting uh, the, the efficiency of cars that can be on the market. Um, but some will also be actions that need to happen further down the line, which we understand from doing this backcasting, but which we need to really prepare for now. So that might be investment in certain technologies or uh, skills development or other, other forms of preparation. And this sort of systemic thinking led us at the ECF to a couple of years ago, really, or a year and a half, to thinking that in order to have a fully comprehensive understanding of whether we're on track to climate neutrality, um, and also to help us plan for that, we need a set of indicators that covers all of these changes and structural shifts um, that, uh, that, we can, that we can track progress on and, and also plan around. So yes, around a year ago or so, we commissioned Ecologic Institute and IDRI to firstly prepare a proposal for just such a framework of indicators. And uh, thank you to you for taking it on. Um, and secondly, to consider where within the EU policy framework such indicators could be integrated. And in fact, it turns out that there's really a number of potential landing points for this work that are very live right now. Uh, which we'll hear about in, in a while, and that really gives us an opportunity to move to a sort of streamlining and integration between different processes if we, if we want to go that way, and we think that perhaps we should. Um, so this is a very timely discussion, and we're really looking forward to, uh, to sharing this, this work with you. Just a couple of words on the framing of the work before we move on to the main substance. First of all, it turns out that, who would have thought it, preparing a full set of climate neutrality indicators, which covers all sectors and dimensions, is a huge job. And to make the task sort of manageable, um, although it was still a huge task, Ecologic and Idri have developed a framework and a concept for doing this, which includes some illustrative examples of fully developed indicators, but not every one of them is done in detail. And partly for that reason, they've not actually done a full assessment of whether or not the EU is on track to climate neutrality, although they do give us what I think is a really compelling illustration of how such an assessment could look. And so what we will see from them is, uh, and, and the approach to the, to the report, uh, is we have a part one, which is an approach, a sort of technical part, which is an approach to a set of indicators, and part two, which is a set of policy recommendations as to where these could be integrated. And then there's a kind of chapeau piece, which is uh, showing how it all fits together. And another thing just to mention is that uh, although we may mostly be talking today in the EU context, um, in practice, the same approach could be very well applied at the national level as well. So, uh, oh yeah, the other thing just to say uh, is that this set of reports uh, the technical part, policy part and the linking summary that's being published as part of the Net Zero 2050 series of reports that ECF has been putting out since 2018. 
um, starting with our initial sort of net zero by 2050 from weather to how uh, that we published uh, with Climact in 2018. Uh, that was a set of pathways. And since then, we've been trying to build up um, and further bottom out a sort of evidence base that helps to answer the weather to how question in terms of both the actions that are needed in different sectors uh, and the governance framework that's needed to guide this. So that's the sort of the context for this discussion. And the way that the rest of the afternoon is going to run is as follows. First of all, we will hear a presentation uh, of uh, the work itself uh, from uh, Nicola and Ika and Matthias, and that will cover both the technical part, the framework itself and the policy sort of integration piece. And then um, after, after that, we will move to a panel discussion with our esteemed panelists who I will introduce properly at the time, but we have Cecile Hanoun from DG Klima in the commission, uh, MEP Jutta Gutterland, who's obviously sort of having a momentous day today after the adoption in the parliament of the climate law. Um, and she'll be arriving with us fresh from voting. Um, and Eduardo Santos uh, representing the Portuguese presidency. And then finally, we'll have around uh, 20, 25 minutes at the end for questions and discussion from the floor. Um, so please do type your questions into the Q&A box uh, that you'll see at the bottom of your screen. And you can also vote there for questions that you like from other people to sort of like bump them up the order so they're more likely to get asked. Um, and I think that's it for the business. There is one other thing we wanted to do. Ah, yes, just the ground rules. You, you are muted, I'm afraid, um, but you have the opportunity to type into the Q&A and use the chat, um, and we will be making a, a recording available afterwards. But although we can't hear you or see you, uh, we want to know who's here. So uh, we're going to do a Mentimeter poll, which I think probably lots of you have used before. Um, you need to type uh, that website address www.menti.com into your phone or a different browser window and then type in that code that you see there and then just tell us where you're joining from and if all goes well we'll see a lovely word cloud sort of appearing and giving us an impression that we are in lots of places all over Europe and maybe even beyond. Nantes, excellent, we've got a uh, uh, someone from the west Paris overtaking Brussels briefly, Brice, Brussels, Copenhagen. I think we've got a good contingent from the EEA maybe, which is bringing up the Copenhagen <laughs> dimension. Ghent, lucky people. Moutin. Wow. That's pretty good continental coverage, I would say. I, I think so, eh? <laughs> I think we would have guessed probably Brussels might be the biggest, but got some close contenders. Great. Well, there you go. We have a little picture then of who's here. Um, and maybe now if we move, if you move, scroll along, there's another question, which is getting down, making you work a bit more. Um, just to get you a, a sense of where people stand on tracking climate neutrality and planning for it in the EU. So if you just move the slider along uh, on that screen, then um, you can uh, give us an indication of whether you agree or or disagree, or to which extent, with each of these statements. This is definitely a more complex question to answer than just typing in your current location. <laughs> but that would be too easy, wouldn't it, to just leave it to that? Oh. Ooh. Okay, so there is a sense at the bottom there that having information can influence policy, which is probably good news. <laughs> yes. And... A general okay. consensus on the importance of climate neutrality as a policy goal as well, I would say. Yep. And I think in a sense, um, we overall have a, a vindication for the fact that the work has been worth it. In a sense, hopefully, if people think these things are necessary. So thank you very much for doing that. We'll do a little check um, on a couple of things at the end as well, just to see um, how it looks and whether today's discussion has um, uh, sort of uh, in, influenced your thinking in any way and, and, and what you think at the end of it.
So uh, thank you a lot for taking part in this um, game, we can almost call it. And I will now pass over to a trio of uh, esteemed presenters uh, who are also the authors of the work uh, and will explain to us uh, what they've got. Uh, we have Matthias Duve, who uh, we've been hearing from a little bit there. He is the head of climate at the Ecologic Institute. Um, and Matthias will present together with his colleague, Aika Karola Velten, who is a senior fellow on climate and energy at Ecologic. And from IDRI, we have Nicola Bergmans, who is a senior fellow on climate and energy. And they have been working very hard on this report. So I'm delighted that we now have the opportunity to see it presented. Over to you, Matthias. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erica, for the kind words of introduction. And thank you, everybody, for joining. It's a real pleasure for us to finally have the chance to share some of our work with a broader audience. There's been indeed a whole team of people involved at both ends. Uh, and if I could have the next slide, please. Uh, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge them. Uh, you know, we obviously uh, owe a debt of gratitude to um, Erica and um, her colleagues for bringing the idea to us and uh, letting, giving us the mandate uh, and then the, the support to be doing this work. And we also want to say thank you to all of the experts that provided feedback along the way at different stages of the work on, you know, it's details such as individual indicators, but also, you know, more conceptual level work and some officials also providing us with um, an explanation of what's happening inside certain EU policy processes. So we owe all of them a debt of gratitude. And if I could have the next slide, just to underline again, what Erica already presented, you know, um, the report, the analysis is available in two parts. Um, and it's also these two parts that we are going to split the presentation into, into. and the first is in, indeed a detailed specific proposal for an assessment framework or matrix for measuring and planning policy towards climate neutrality. And the second part is an analysis of how they could be integrated into EU policy processes. But now, without further ado, I'm handing it over to uh, the authors of the part one report and the first speaker is Nicola. Please take it away. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, thank you. And I share the pleasure to, to share our work uh, that uh, we did uh, and we are happy to present today. So uh, the first question uh, on the next slide, like is to where do we start it from? And we started from uh, uh, asking ourselves what constitutes a climate neutral future. Uh, because if we want to describe the progress, we need to start from this question. And so what we did is uh, really to looking at the existing literature on pathways to climate neutrality and what they say about what are the needed transformations in our economies. So you might be familiar with this figure. Uh, it comes from the European Commission's communication on a vision for a climate neutral Europe and describes what are the mitigation efforts in different sectors. Um, and well, first of all, you have to recognize that all of these sectors are quite specific. They have specific challenges and there's some transformation that are really linked to the sectors. Um, so that would be a first thing uh, where, the, where we start from. The th second thing, and I think like really uh, the work that the Commission did in 2018 uh, translated that well, increasingly in long-term decarbonization pathways, there are uh, mentions of what we could call or we describe as cross-sectoral challenges that are mentioned. How do we green finance? How do we ensure just transition? Uh, or how do we talk about lifestyle changes? So all that is present in the literature. And Given that, uh, we wanted to come up with a concept that you see on this slide uh, that is able to describe these both of these dimensions. So what we did, we kind of separate uh, all the transformation that need to happen in different elements. We come up with 11 elements. Uh, six of them are sectoral ones and maybe more traditionally looked at uh, when we assess progress on decarbonization. So you'll see uh, there that we refer to the transformation of the agri-food system, the uh, net zero industrial emissions uh, reduction, uh, the uh, reduction of emissions in buildings, the reduction of emissions in transport, the transformation of the overall um, 
uh, energy system, and also what is increasingly um, recognized uh, with these uh, net zero uh, goals is the need to uh, decrease our, um, our emissions and improve our carbon dioxide removals. So this is at the center of uh, this concept. It's in green. And around it, we identified five cross-sectoral elements that are important to consider, um, which are uh, the governance, uh, finding a good governance for uh, climate, transforming a financial system, ensuring this trans transition to climate neutrality, enabling technologies, and on the other side, lifestyle changes. So we have this concept that describes the transformation, and we started from there to identify uh, the, the indicators that we need to assess progress. Next slide, please. So uh, the, the core of our concept is to derive these indicators from these elements. So we basically, how did we do that? We did two things. For each element, we try to identify what objectives already exist or could be defined. And according to this objective, we uh, selected indicators that are able to describe the progress towards this objective. But we wanted to go also kind of a bit further to have an early indication of what are the stumbling blocks and uh, trying to uh, refine the policy making and, uh, and planning processes. So what we did, we also do, did a review, a review of literature, trying to find what we call enablers. Uh, enablers, uh, key enablers uh, defined as uh, elements that are key to unlock transformations in uh, these elements. So we did that first through a review of, uh, of the literature, but also through interviews with experts on uh, decarbonization of, on each of the sectors or each of the dimensions uh, the other elements that we analyze. So concretely, how did it work? Uh, let's look at uh, the, uh, the next slide with an, an example. Uh, so here we use, uh, we analyze uh, the elements uh, on the energy system. So the zero carbon energy uh, assess um, uh, elements. And as I said, we started by identifying the key objectives uh, that apply for the sector. So here we use both short-term and long-term uh, object, uh, objectives that are defined. First, for example, we have this target in Europe of renewable energy supply in 2030 to 32% uh, to today. And in the long term, we have the objective, if we want to reach uh, climate neutrality, what says uh, the long-term strategy is to have clearly uh, no unabated fossil fuel and zero emissions in um, uh, energy system by then. So this helps us also to find indicators that are quite uh, common and already existing today. But we also identified key enablers that according to the literature hinder progress on the, uh, this front. And we've identified three enablers that uh, are key, supporting regulatory frameworks infrastructure to enable uh, uh, and secure uh, a secure transition, and uh, the third enabler that is reducing total energy consumption. And for each of them, we try to find indicators that are able to describe uh, if we are on track uh, according to this uh, enabler for decarbonization. So on the next slide, you'll see a full table of indicators, and you'll find it in the report for each of the elements that either are connected to the objective or um, to each of the enabler. Um, and uh, you have this table of indicator that we suggest uh, as a way of assessing the progress uh, in, uh, in this sector. This is not exhaustive, but we kept in this table everything we found relevant. We provide for each indicator information in the table with suggested data sources when they exist and associated sources to define uh, or uh, to define 2050 objectives against which the progress can be assessed from. So for example, here uh, in the table, you'll see that in the uh, column on the, on the right, you have references to the EU LTS in, uh, in, some, uh, in some cases, because there you, you can see uh, clearly, uh, or you can find data that can describe the transformation according to this indicator uh, in the EU LTS. Um, 
we can go to the next slide. You, you'll see that it's the, the rest of the table just to show you the, the kind of information that are there. In some cases, uh, we also identify data gaps where there's no information available. I finished uh, before ending uh, it over to Acre. I just wanted to show you another element, a cross-sector element, the one on finance. So it's on the next slide, just to show you that this concept also applies to this kind of cross-sectoral elements. So we proceeded in the same manner with, or, uh, with the uh, horizontal elements. Um, here, you see objectives are different. Uh, they are not defined in terms uh, of uh, current objectives, but we took for the finance one uh, data from the impact assessment accompanying the LTS, the long-term strategy, uh, the European long-term strategy, or the impact assessment on uh, the next revision of uh, the climate objective, uh, the 2030 climate objective, which, uh, uh, which describes the investment gap uh, that is needed for decarbonization. So here you have numbers in billions of euros uh, missing in investment in the EU energy sector. Same way, you, we have enablers uh, identified first one, orient public funds toward the transition, enabling regulatory framework also, and align the financial system with climate. You see that in this, uh, it's more related to regulation and policies. And we come up with a table also. So in the, ne uh, in the next slide, you'll see uh, what, I'm not going to go through the detail of the table, but you'll see in the third column that uh, what is striking in this horizontal element that is today there's less uh, data sources available on uh, this horizontal element and there's more need to uh, identify uh, to to work on monitoring these dimensions of the transformation and also on the uh, last column you see that there's less objectives that are easy to define today and maybe work uh, on this to be done I, it, uh, I stopped there and hand it over to Acre uh, to continue the presentation on the technical part. Thank you, Nicola. Um, so as part of our work, we also carried out an illustrative progress measurement, which is uh, mainly based on the EU SDG monitoring methodology. So our progress measurement is thus based on the average annual increase or decrease of an indicator over a specific time period. This trend is then compared to the desired development of an indicator. So we had a look at the past five years of which data is available, and then we checked, or basically we classified the trend development. So here you can see our classification in this table. So it is either in line with the net zero emission objective, progressive, but still insufficient, not supportive, or if the trend even goes into the wrong direction, it is opposing the net zero emission objective. If there is no target for an indicator, we also use the percentage values from the SDG monitoring to classify the indicator development. Apart from the SDG monitoring methodology, we also allocated scores from one to four to each of the classes. <laughs> this would allow for deriving the composite value for each element by calculating the mean value over a set of indicators. We actually used it to classify indicators that constitute of different sub-indicators. This was, for example, the case for freight model shift, which I will show you later. So now, Eva, I will come to the examples of our illustrative progress measurement. So here you can see the progress measurement within the element zero carbon energy. It is for the deployment of renewables, which is one of the key objectives there. Um, the indicator is the share of renewables and the trend is taken from Eurostat. The target values are the EU 2030 target. And for 2050, we took the 2050 value outlined in the long-term strategy of the EU. Our analysis then showed that the deployment of renewables was progressive, but still insufficient for the net zero emission objective. This is due to the fact that the trend is just over 60% of the desired development. Next slide, Eva, please. Thanks. Here you can see the result for the share of environmental tax revenue. So we used a target value from a commission working document or paper associated with the EU resource efficiency roadmap. So the target is 10% in 2020. And we assume that the share should generally increase until 2050. The assessment then shows that the past development is going into the wrong direction and thus is opposing the net zero emission objective. Next, please. In the element moving without emission, we had a look at the progress of freight model shift. 
It includes three sub-indicators. The development of road transport and inland navigation was actually opposing the net zero emission objective, while the rail transport development of the past five years was in line with it. In combination, this means that the developments we saw in freight transport were not supportive. And now coming to my last example, uh, this is for climate neutral governance. There we check the progress in member states to establish a scientific adversary body for climate policy. You can see here that the developments were, are, were also not supporting the emission objective, whereby we selected here the target value based on expert judgment. To sum up, um, we added an illustrative scoreboard showing the results, in this case only for one indicator in each of the elements. Such a scoreboard could be based on a specific headline indicator in each element or a composite value over the selected indicators in an element. In this respect, a headline indicator is easy to understand but provides information only in one dimension. A composite value is a bit more complicated, but it could combine or different indicators and we can communicate a more comprehensive view on progress as an element. What you can see here is a preliminary analysis of us. So it is only based on one indicator in each element. And it shows that progress is largely insufficient in most of the elements. But while these example indicators provide, of course, only first impression. To come to our conclusions. Um, from the Mentimeter at the beginning, I know that we all agree that the EU needs to keep track on whether it is on the path to net zero. And we think that this indicator framework can help in this respect. In particular, it can help to improve planning and reporting. For example, it helps to consider all the relevant aspects in our transition. And it informs about the overall progress, but also on specific enablers. And this can help to identify where additional effort and possibly policy intervention is required. Our work also showed that we need additional work and harmonization and centralization of existing data. And we need new data as well as clear targets, in particular in the horizontal elements such as finance, lifestyle change, just transition and governance. So thanks a lot from my side. And now I hand over to my dear colleague, Matthias, who will present options for concrete integration of this framework. Thank you so much to, to both Eike and Nicola. Um, and moving on swiftly so that we can get to our expert opinions. Um, when we started the analysis of the integration of net zero indicators in the, into EU policy processes, we first considered which are the most relevant ones that exist that have the objective of climate neutrality integrated in some form and are also um, trying to assess whether the contributions they're making towards it are adequate or sufficient. And here, the European Green Deal that is also on, on top of the slide is the obvious one because it's the, the first policy document that enshrines the goal as um, something for, that the EU is actually agreeing to pursue together um, and makes it a guiding principle um, for uh, future policy making. Uh, in the communication from December 2018, uh, there is also a, a dashboard promise that would monitor progress on a regular basis. So clearly here is also a place in that overview um, framing document for progress measurement. In the meantime, of course, today the, being the important day for the EU climate law, this objective of climate neutrality has now been enshrined in law and is legally binding on the union as a whole. But the EU climate law does not only um, you know, confirm that topic as that target is binding, but also establishes several processes uh, for checking that it is being adhered to. There's progress measurement, there's a check on policy at EU and national level and seeing whether that is um, in line and consistent with um, the goal. There are, however, no details in the legislation on how these processes will be operationalized. Then uh, to anyone working on EU climate and energy policy, the governance regulation has been uh, um, formative in the way that is, has established and somewhat changed now the way in which member states are planning for and reporting on their planned activities and policies to achieve on the one hand 2030 targets, but then also their long-term objective. The regulation has already been revised somewhat in specific places through the EU climate law to address climate neutrality as a goal in both planning and reporting, but it's really essential um, going forward 
um, that um, this goal is there to inform the updates to, for example, national energy and climate plans that are um, having to be revised by 2023. 2023, sorry. Uh, then um, the climate neutrality objective is also one of the specific targets that are being integrated into the European semester. Otherwise, of course, uh, you know, our core economic governance vehicle. Um, and that is being done as part of a process of greening the European semester, integrating a broader set of sustainability considerations into the governance cycle. And that um, is being done by increasingly also adopting country specific recommendations on sustainability issues, including climate and energy that are meant to support national reforms. And, um, and therefore now there are also um, uh, indicator sets that, that need to be developed and applied for monitoring progress under the semester towards uh, these issues. Uh, we already heard that of course the recovery processes are big news uh, this week, the, the plans being adopted, the council has the issue on the agenda and the European semester has been rewired to some extent to serve the recovery process over the past year. And the regulation that has established the main vehicle for dispersing the funding to member states, the Recovery and Resilience Facility, um, includes as a specific objective climate neutrality by 2050 and also mandates that a share, a very specific share of 37% minimum of the funding needs to go to climate action. And so Again, the neutrality objective is clearly enshrined and there is a dedicated progress monitoring system that's foreseen in the legislation. And in fact, inside the commission preparations are already underway to adopt delegated acts to establish a scoreboard for the RRF and a set of common indicators. The last of these dedicated processes that we included in the analysis is the one that started most recently. It's the eighth environmental action program for which a proposal was presented by the Commission last October. The EAP, of course, covers a broad range of environmental topics. Again, climate neutrality is only one of them, but it is there. Um, and the Commission included the outlines of a monitoring framework also under the proposal. The seventh EAP didn't really have one, and uh, the assessment back then had said, you know, the next uh, program should have a dedicated system. Uh, and since the publication of the proposal, both Parliament, Parliament and Council have actually said Commission proposal already going in the right direction, but please become more specific um, about reporting requirements and, and also measuring whether the structural change is happening. So here again, a process for the development of indicators to be used by the 8th EAP is currently already underway. So what does this um, you know, running through um, these um, processes actually mean for the ways in which net zero indicators could best and should be best integrated here in EU policy processes. And so you are already seeing now the slide that has a timeline that shows you the, the parallel processes and it may already have been become um, apparent from my cycling through them that there are several decisions and um, processes underway that will come to fruition in 2021 and uh, into 2022. So right now we are looking at a window of opportunity to integrate um, the, the work that is being done in different places. And uh, our policy recommendation from the analysis is clearly we need a common set of indicators, a common and integrated approach here. And we would recommend that the Commission start a transparent and inclusive process for the development of such an integrated um, um, assessment framework based on net zero indicators. Um, there is otherwise a risk that these individual processes all come to slightly different ways of measuring progress and informing policy that could send uh, contradictory mes messages and would also constitute you know, duplication of effort. From our perspective, uh, the EU climate law is basically the main home for this process. This is where there is already a clear mandate to the Commission to develop a, a progress measurement methodology 
And um, the, the problem here is that the, um, there isn't any detail on the EU climate law process. And there are the HVAP and the um, efforts under the recovery process that are coming to decisions earlier. So what we need right now is a commitment that there is meant to be in the future this integrated approach um, and uh, that there is a decision that there is this main vehicle that will develop um, what that system looks like going forward. I just want to mention two more specific additional actions that would improve process and the integration of net zero indicators. And that is on the one hand, uh, providing an update to the EU long-term strategy, in particular, the underlying modeling on pathways to net zero. There isn't in the legislation right now uh, a mandate for such an update or an obligation uh, on the Commission to provide one. And we've already talked about how important and formative it was in establishing climate neutrality. But um, it's now out of date. The 2030 target is being increased to 55%. There's new information available. So the modeling uh, and the strategy need to be updated. And that can then help inform um, an assessment matrix and tracking progress by using that information to help set benchmarks for progress measurement. And the second step is to revise the governance regulation. It's already been you know, tweaked in bits and pieces through the EU climate law, but it's really essential that um, these net zero indicators now are, are more formally enshrined as, as a means of, of helping inform the next set of NECPs, the reporting by member states, maybe an assessment by the Commission of national long-term strategies, etc. And the Commission has already um, anticipated the need to revise the governance regulation, but decided for some reason not to include it in the Fit for 55 package. And so our assessment would be that what, what this is all about is actually making the EU governance system fit for net zero. And that's also why we need the governance regulation to be revised accordingly. I hope that um, um, I have provided enough um, of a glimpse of our analysis. There's, of course, a lot of detailed chapters on each of the processes in our report. And I now look forward to hearing what our experts and the audience make of our uh, analysis and our insights. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Matthias and Aika and Nicola for, for laying out the work. Um, I, think, I think it comes through very clearly quite how much thought has gone into organising and structuring the system. Um, and seeing the scoreboard, I, it's only illustrative, I know, for one indicator. I, I don't know how you felt in the audience, but I found that it really reinforces the need for such a tracking tool. Um, seeing so starkly how, you know, not on track we are, at least on that indicator, it's quite impactful. And that can, you know, having such a thing may be a way to not get too lost in the details of each thing that we're working on, but really keep in mind the big picture. Um, so I see a couple of questions have come in from the audience, but I, I think um, I, it would be nice to move directly to our panel. So if it's all right, I'll uh, leave those for the for the last section. Um, and uh, welcome, uh, Jutta. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. I know you've just come fresh from your, your voting session, so uh, thanks for coming in. Um, uh, so as I, I mentioned briefly before, we've got a really excellent panel. We have Cecile Hanun, uh, who is the head of uh, the unit C2 at DG Klima, which covers governance and effort sharing um, at the European Commission. Uh, we have uh, Jutta Gutland, um, known to many of us, I think, as um, the rapporteur of the uh, European Climate Law, a uh, member of the European Parliament from the S&D Group. Uh, and then we have Eduardo Santos, who is the head of the Climate Department at the Portuguese Environment Agency, uh, and he's here today representing the Portuguese Presidency. So thank you ever so much uh, to all of you for joining us. Um, and I'm going to turn first to Cecile, um, who, uh, and I understand your unit is not only preparing the Fit for 55 package, but also has uh, a, an important role with the recovery plan. So uh, busy workload and, and we really appreciate your time today. Um, as we know, Cecile, uh, climate neutrality is the objective that is uh, at the heart and the centre of the Green Deal. Uh, and it's now become legally binding uh, through the EU climate law today. Um, so uh, 
my first question to you is quite simply, what are the European Commission's plans for how to keep track of monitoring progress? Um, and hearing what Matthias was saying about this, the, the need for a sort of integrated approach across processes, uh, do you see the need for that kind of integration? Thanks. Many thanks, Erika, and uh, thanks for the, for the report and the invitation. A uh, very timely uh, source of reflection. Uh, and I think it echoes many reflections we are having uh, within and outside the Commission on, on how to measure progress towards uh, climate neutrality. And I find that the approach you're having also to sort of uh, take, take it to the output uh, aspect, you know, seeing, uh, you know, the, the very end of the, of the process, what it could be in terms of indicators, uh, definitely very interesting. Um, maybe what I can I can say in terms of general comments is that I think we've seen uh, since um, the presentation of the Commission vision for a climate neutral, neutral EU uh, in, in November 2018 that Nicola referred to earlier. I think we've seen uh, very much how uh, climate neutrality by 2050 has become somehow the, the direction of travel, and of course this is only uh, reinforced by what you have mentioned. Uh, the fact that it's now enshrined into law uh, uh, in the climate law uh, very strongly. And I think that fact that, that it's the direction of travel, uh, we are seeing every day the impact on policies. If we just you know, stop one minute and reflect everything that has happened uh, since uh, late 2018 uh, and how much the fact that we have this direction of travel is basically impacting everything we do in climate and energy policies, but more importantly, in all the other sectoral policies and also in all the horizontal policies that you also that were also are highlighted in the report and are uh, rightly highlighted because it, it's very important. Um, how do we measure progress today? I think in some way we measure it every year. You know, we have this uh, climate action progress report where we uh, basically uh, uh, give the, the latest figures in terms of emission reductions and uh, compared to our uh, international base year 1990, and that's already a measurement of progress. Uh, I think we are all seeing that we need to go further than that. Uh, we need to go further than that first because we are not just looking at emission reductions now, but we are looking at net zero, which is a balance. So certainly, uh, we need to start reflection also how best to uh, measure removals. Uh, and then if we stay a little bit at this high level, uh, maybe one additional element that I want to mention, which is also uh, very much present in the, in the climate law, is the whole issue of adaptation and resilience. Because in fact, it's not indeed a part of climate neutrality as such, uh, but it should very much be uh, in the landscape because it's not one or the other, we have to do both at the same time. And for example, um, we've seen, uh, you mentioned that my unit was working on the recovery plans. Uh, we've seen that in many of the, the projects and the, the investments that member states were thinking about, you have many examples where mitigation and, ad and adaptation are very closely linked. So I think we, we need to keep that in mind. Um, what I find really interesting about the, the report is really the idea to go beyond uh, these kind of uh, he headline indicators and look at what uh, climate neutrality means in terms of systematic changes uh, and systemic changes are, as you highlighted and the fact that you tried uh, really to develop a holistic approach and uh, congratulations for that, because when you see the, the depth of the report, it's not an easy exercise, but I think it's exactly the value of climate neutrality that you have to look at all of this. You know, that it's not anymore, oh, if we do everything with energy, it will be enough. Uh, all sectors need to do their part and, and we need to look at all those dimensions. Um, in terms of uh, how we see, um, maybe the, 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 the development uh, a little bit uh, taking into account the climate law. We think that the climate law basically establishes a very strong governance framework, uh, which builds on the governance regulation. Uh, we can say somehow that we are lucky for the climate and energy fields that we have the governance regulation. It's an enormous added value. Um, and uh, 
Of course, the core of the progress monitoring under the climate law are the progress reports that both EU and the member states uh, we need to deliver in 2023. And for us, this is the, the, the main element. Uh, but I also want to highlight that uh, the climate law uh, basically makes those links with the governance regulation that Matthias already mentioned uh, and basically ensures that the, the reports that are already planned under the governance regulation will also look at the 2050 perspective. And this is definitely also very important to have this uh, enshrined. If you allow me, I have a few more reflections. Um, because I found that what, what you have shared was really, really uh, rich, but uh, there are a few reflections that I wanted to share with you. Um, one of the things is, is not to forget the focus of the different exercises. And I think you, you, the, the, the last slides, you know, with the various processes and the timeline uh, for, for people, if, if we have people joining that are a bit far away uh, from these issues, usually it can be pretty, you know, <laughs> impressive. Um, what I, what I think is that we should not forget what is the different focus of the different exercises. As I mentioned, we have things that are really focused on the climate and energy world. And here we are really lucky because also uh, we, we, with the concept of CO2 equivalence, we can measure, you know, we can synthesize a lot of progress already in one indicator. And I think that's one difference, for example, with some uh, work which is wider than climate and energy and is uh, as part of the green uh, field, so to say. So either what is under the Green Deal or what is under the Eight Environmental Action Program, where you look at other dimension of, of environment policy, which are also not that easy to synthesize. Uh, because, for example, on the environmental side, if you need just the concept of pollution, uh, if you need to synthesize this, it's not that easy because you talk about air, you talk about water, you talk about soils, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And finally, the third group, I think uh, uh, Matthias rightly mentioned uh, the European semester and the work on recovery. Uh, here, I think we touched something which is also very important for us, which is mainstreaming uh, climate in other policies and in particular in economic policies. But again, when you think about indicators, I think it's good to keep in mind what is the focus of the different exercises, because we might not need uh, the same things exactly, but we should definitely pay attention to, to synergies and, and avoid duplication. Um, maybe uh, a, a few more comments which are a bit methodolog more methodological maybe. Um, I think one of the difficulty is to say you need an indicator, you need basically to know what you are trying to measure. And I think uh, one, one of the uh, uh, reflections which came to my mind uh, when look at, uh, looking at the very detailed work that you did uh, topic by topic is that for many of those items, we actually don't have a target. And I, I'm saying that also quite clearly uh, because I wouldn't want people to uh, believe or understand, for example, that the EU long-term strategy contains sectoral targets because it's not the case. Uh, the figures that you find and that you have used, uh, they are the result of the modeling. So basically, we made some analysis to show how the transition to uh, climate neutrality by 2050 was possible, but it doesn't mean they are agreed as a target. And I think this is part of the difficult, uh, you know, reflections. Uh, because it's one thing to say it's possible and this is what it would mean. And this is another thing to say, let's agree uh, all, all uh, you know, stakeholders that this should be a target. And I think this is one of the difficulties in, uh, in setting uh, indicators. Uh, finally, and this has to do very much also with the time perspective, because obviously now we are working on revising our targets for 2030, which is basically our next uh, you know, uh, uh, um, um, perspective, uh, but it's one thing to set targets for 2030, which is already, uh, uh, you know, in the next decade. It's another thing to set targets much longer in time. Uh, and so from that aspect, also, it's an added value of the climate law to set a cycle uh, to progressively uh, uh, establish those targets. And finally, I think there are questions around the questions of uh, how do you qualify trends and how do you synthesize uh, several indicators? And I think I, 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 I uh, find a lot of useful uh, uh, food for thought uh, in the report, 
uh, it's tempting to try to have composite indicators and to synthesize, but it's not easy to do. And we also have to reflect about the weight it has, because when you see, when you show something visually catchy, uh, you need to be clear also what is behind. Uh, I'm very inspired by the topic, so I'm probably getting way too long, <laughs> uh, but that's because I found it was really the, the source of a, a very interesting reflection. So I'll, I'll stop here, but uh, I'm happy to, to continue and uh, the discussion later. Many thanks. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Cecile. And uh, Noah, I think it was it was useful to hear your reflections, both on the general sort of concept and overview and, and then on some of the, the more details of, of how it's actually operationalized. Um, I'm going to turn now to to Yuta. Um, and uh, Yuta, congratulations uh, on having managed to negotiate an agreement that was adopted today uh, on yes. the climate law. Um, so, uh, yeah. Yes, and I will focus on the climate law. I mean, uh, interesting to hear Cecile's point about uh, looking at uh, the focus of the different instruments and processes, but I think the climate law obviously is the very central instrument that's looking at the climate neutrality goal. Um, and the climate, uh, yeah, the, the, this, this objective is, is, is there, but it's also in several other processes. And I would just like to ask you a very similar question, really, as, as, as we asked to Yuta, which is, how important do you think it is to have a detailed system for tracking progress uh, towards this goal, um, going beyond even just the emissions trajectory tracking perhaps? Um, and maybe you can add to that whether you see some opportunities within the climate law for introducing that kind of detailed monitoring. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, uh, Erika, and thank you for letting me be in this uh, panel. And uh, it was also very interesting to, to listen uh, to the uh, panelists before me. Uh, I, uh, I must say that I find that uh, these uh, indicators are extremely important. Uh, I see them as, of course, a foundation uh, to know where we are and uh, what we need to do. So I believe this is a very valid and important report uh, with this uh, um, indicators. And I also believe that um, uh, it is important for the Commission in the work, as been said, uh, to, to use it and uh, also make sure, of course, that uh, we have transparency and uh, that uh, this, is, uh, this is something that we can all uh, relate to and use in, in the work for the upcoming uh, climate legislation. And uh, in the climate law, uh, I believe that uh, there are um, uh, things that, that will help uh, and that will also uh, facilitate uh, the, the upcoming work with uh, different sectorial legislations and also, of course, in the future with the climate law itself. Um, I think uh, some points that are important in the law uh, is um, that we have this... Um, uh, part that we are saying that uh, the member state needs to report every second year how things are going and uh, that will be uh, I think a very valid instrument that will help uh, all of us uh, to understand what we need to do uh, and I think uh, there of course uh, uh, um, how this how, how well it will work will also be uh, the Commission will also, of course, be uh, responsible for, for how well it will work. But I think this is something that I'm happy about that will make the climate law more uh, into the reality and make sure that it does what it's supposed to do. I also think uh, that it is important that we have this um, uh, uh, climate advisory uh, board on climate change. I think this uh, scientific board with 15 experts who will de deliver a report every year, at least one uh, every year, uh, that will also uh, evaluate uh, our own targets, but also the Paris Agreement. I think this body will be very sufficient and it will it will help us all to to know what we what we are doing and and make us aware how the situation looks i mean in the beginning people said that this is 
it's already done, it's done in the member states or we have the international level, but this is not it. It's about making sure that we on this very potent level, that's the EU level, that we know what we are doing and that we have uh, uh, enough data and we have uh, um, indicative uh, um, uh, indicators that will help us uh, so we know what we are doing. So this is not about how the world is doing. This is not about how one member state is doing, but it's about us and also in relation to the Paris Agreement. So this is something that I think will, will help us and one of the things that I'm also most happy about uh, today. And then, of course, the greenhouse gas budget, but that's another discussion maybe. But um, I'm also very happy about that when it comes to the climate law. Great. Thanks, Jutta. And uh, yeah, really interesting that you mentioned the scientific body, because I think um, that was an element that uh, that I think many, many people watching were very pleased to see uh, that was incorporated to the law. Um, the mandate for it is not that specific in the law. Um, and at the moment, it, it's, for example, it's not sort of stipulated that the Commission would need to include that body in progress monitoring. Um, so I, I understand from what you're saying that actually you would think it'd be a good idea that that, that body would be directly involved in the progress monitoring that needs to be done under the law. Is that, would, would that I, I fair think Yes, absolutely, I think so, definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, to be used, uh, of course, they are independent. That's uh, that's an idea, uh, but that doesn't mean that they are not valid for uh, as a tool uh, to help out in the sense that they can. Uh, and and I I think that the, it will be for the Commission uh, a, a body that will help and will be uh, both pushing us all, but also be helpful for us to know where we are. So I think uh, this is not about. Uh, demanding from them to do something else than the, the law is saying, but it's about uh, using the knowledge that they will uh, provide. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I'll turn quickly now to Eduardo. Um, so Eduardo is, is the head of the climate department uh, at the Portuguese Environment Agency, I think I said that already, um, <laughs> representing the presidency. Um, and the presidency, uh, of course, oversaw the adoption of the climate law. So um, congratulations and thanks to you too. Um, and um, it's sort of interesting because Portugal uh, is a country that has already set itself the goal of climate neutrality back in 2016 um, and then followed through with a, a fairly sort of comprehensive process to define a, a strategy to meet that goal. Um, so just actually uh, taking your perspective, not, not so much specifically as um, uh, well, but as, as both presidency and a national representative, could you just tell us a little bit about how you monitor progress to climate neutrality on a national level um, and whether you see anything in what was presented today, potentially, you know, could could a more specific methodology be be helpful? Um, could you uh, share some thoughts on that? Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's very nice to be here uh, on this on this day of the uh, adoption of the climate law by, by the EP and uh, very soon to be signed on also by by the council um, on uh, on on the question and and thanks also for the work on the on the indicators I I, I have to confess the f my first reaction going through the the papers was oh my god this is a tremendous amount of uh, of information and work that is there but uh, stepping back a bit you we have to recognize that it is a tremendous uh, amount of of work and the transformation that we are talking about climate neutrality net zero uh, by by 2050 it, it it is in fact uh, a goal uh, that that touches upon all of the all, all of the aspects of, of our lives. So uh, translating that into uh, this sort of uh, indicators, uh, it, it is it, it is indeed uh, useful. Um, I, I I think that the aspect that came across as more relevant or more immediately st struck me as more. Uh, Relevant in, in the in the analysis is the mapping out that you have done 
of all the different aspects that are there because what one one could say that and and until a couple of years ago and definitely before the um, the the adoption of the of the goal of of net zero on the part of of the eu uh, we we could we were more or less thinking uh, along the lines of a progressive transformation of of our of our uh, societies uh, and so the the use of greenhouse gas emissions and some other more sectoral uh, aspects could be seen as uh, uh, the, the the right way to to monitor that kind of progressive uh, uh, transformation that 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 was to 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 take place from the moment that we uh, that we set ourselves with this really uh, tremendous task of transforming our societies that immediately uh, brings into play all of the enablers and other aspects that that you've touched upon lifestyle changes just transition aspects uh, sustainable finance aspects uh, circular economy aspects also um, that do need uh, different systems to uh, bring information to the context of of emission reduction which in the, in the end, it, 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 it's where, where we are. Uh, you've asked how, how do we monitor at the national level the, the, the progress? We, we basically, we are, we are building on the, um, the structures, the governance structures that were already uh, in existence. We're using the, the NECP uh, structures to, um, to we have to cut it in, in in slices and the next decade is a crucial decade and and it's the one that we we are focused on in delivering uh the our, our net zero commitment so the first thing that we that we we've done is from the 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 roadmap and the, the that that outlines the pathways towards that net zero commitment we've translated that into our necp so uh, by the, by that our NECP is aligned with the trajectory by for 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 uh, net zero by 2050, and then we build on uh, specific uh, objectives and uh, and indicators to to track progress uh, in 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 that respect, uh, and and obviously when you start to include again finance and and those other aspects, it's it's really uh, important that you that you have a mapping of what is happening out there. And there, are, there is a lot of things happening out there as our colleagues from the commission and, and, and from the, the European Parliament would, would no, no doubt uh, agree. Uh, at the moment, we are at the moment where basically everything is in movement uh, in order to have this uh, uh, hopeful, uh, hopefully in the right way in order to have this uh, alignment towards uh, towards that goal. So uh, in, in short, I, I think this um, not losing track of, of all the aspects that are there and that are relevant then that contribute to, to the to this transformation is 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 really important. Um, it is a gigantic task to have uh, to keep track of of all of this, uh, and we we shouldn't uh, lose uh, sight that there 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 are already in place uh, extensive uh, systems and reporting systems, MRV systems, both at uh, EU, national, and uh, UNFCCC uh, levels. Uh, that that both member states and the the EU have to have to comply. Uh, so it's not that there isn't information out there. Uh, so th there is there is information that there. The mapping helps to also keep track of what information exists and also to identify what information we need to develop and how how best to to go about in in, in that respect. Um, let me just 
to finish with with one uh, mentioning one uh, specific aspect that we've um, also started doing uh, last year, which is a legislative impact assessment on uh, development of, of um, policy policy proposals. Uh, we have established a system, a still relatively simple system, to um, basically check if a policy proposal is aligned or not with the objectives of climate neutrality. Um, it's, it's still more or less in a pilot phase, but uh, it's something that we're looking in, in, with interest to see how, how, it will, how it will develop. And uh, uh, the Jutta, uh, uh, as, as also mentioned, the, the role that adaptation plays in, um, in the climate law. And uh, I would also stress that uh, in parallel with the net zero target, we also have uh, uh, right now a long-term vision of climate, of climate resilient union. Uh, to be uh, uh, to to be pursued also by by mid century, uh, as proposed in the new uh, adaptation strategy that the, the communication that the ministers uh, strongly endorsed, environment ministers strongly endorsed also uh, this uh, long term vision. So it is uh, something that we 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 should also uh, keep in mind and also as part of uh, indicators in tracking that, that progress. Thanks. Great. Uh, thank you, Ado. Really interesting. And um, yeah, I think interesting in particular to hear about Portugal having this uh, system for checking whether policies are going to be in line with the climate neutral goal. Um, and actually sort of uh, riffing off that, I pass back to Jutta. Um, uh, and by the way, please, uh, everybody who's here, do feel free to type questions into the uh, the Q and A box uh, um, if you if you have things you would like to ask the panelists or even to the back to the presenters. Um, but I, uh, so yes, Jutta, um, obviously the there there are the climate law provides a framework and some 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 key things that will need to be done. Um, how important do you think it is that there be a, a sort of transparent uh, methodology for uh, for fleshing some of those things out, like how the how the progress monitoring will be done, or how the uh, checks about policy proposals with the climate neutrality goal? Um, can you just say a bit about what you would ideally like to see, even about the process by which that is that is done? Thanks. Yeah, but of course, we are in the beginning of this transition and uh, there are many things still missing. Uh, and uh, I think we really got a good start today uh, in the parliament and very soon in the, also in the council uh, with the climate law. And it, has, uh, it is filling some of the gaps that is there, but there is a missing part, absolutely, indicators that will uh, help us to monitor where we are uh, and also in a more holistic uh, way and help the commission that is still not there. And uh, I, think, I think also we will, when I was uh, working with the sectorial legislation uh, last legislature, I find often uh, it's surprising that we were working with uh, one sectorial legislation and we didn't know how it fit into what the other uh, <laughs> negotiation was, how, how that was working. And it was not a holistic view. And the climate law is trying to, to bridge that and make sure that we don't have these holes where we can emit in between the, the, the uh, legislations, both literally and also more uh, by the fact that the, the legislature doesn't work together. But so that's what we're trying to do with the climate law. And also I think the budget will help us to know more where we are and so on, but there's still, we still miss um, the indicators uh, that will help us uh, know exactly uh, the, uh, the pathway and uh, how, how we are progressing and also knowing more about how different legislations are working in the in the direction towards climate neutrality and I think your 11 uh, indicators are, are doing that and uh, helping helping that uh, but 
uh, that said, I think uh, that is why we we start uh, the transition by saying that there are many things we need to do with the methodology. Uh, there are still many things to be done there. We just took the very biggest holes in between the sectorial legislation and we, we, we tried to have a foundation or what you call it, or uh, uh, I would not say, the, the, I would say if, uh, we, have, we have now something like an umbrella that will help us understand uh, where we are, but there are still lots to do with the methodology uh, if we are going to success, uh, be successful and also work systematically. And I'm also thinking about the MFF and uh, the situation we have where we might with one hand reduce emissions and with the other one we, we spend on, uh, uh, on fossil fuel activities a lot. Uh, so this is also something that's very um, not fulfilling today and it's uh, it's something that we need to to see and be more aware about um, and I also see of course that um, this rescue EU after the pandemic is the same I think uh, there is many Im images about what needs to be done and we need to be more in line with each other so we know all the institutions know what we are trying to do together when it comes to the transition and how we work in a not uh, against each other and also against uh, uh, the climate. Excellent, thank you, Jutta. Um, and sort of bouncing off that again, I'd like to come back to you, Cecile. <laughs> I expect you knew that was coming. Um, could you just uh, say a bit for us about the process? Um, that uh, you expect to use in a, in a way to flesh out some of those those elements of the climate law. Um, I mean, I know you've got a lot of other things on at the moment, and and maybe the the, the exact details of that still need to be completely fleshed, sort of developed. But uh, but it would be good to understand how you plan to do it. And if I may throw in at the same time um, something that is sort of emerging a lot in uh, discussions, I think, among stakeholders at the moment is whether there uh, is a need for revision of the governance regulation. Uh, uh, as was mentioned today, as another possible vehicle for um, using uh, some of the thinking in this, this indicators work, uh, partly because of the, 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 the change in targets, partly perhaps because of um, climate neutrality now being in law and sort of evolving recognition of, of, of other elements that will need to be factored in, like the just transition part and the uh, removals part, as well as, uh, as reductions and so on. Um, so yes, uh, would you be able to tell us just a little bit about your your, your thinking on those matters at the moment. Thank you. Sure, I, I will do my best. Um, in terms of thinking where we are, I think we all recognize uh, the benefits of uh, having had the NECPs, and I'm going back again to the work we are doing on the, on the resilience plan and the work that member states have done. Uh, I think it was a very good sequence in the sense that uh, for, for the recovery plans, uh, because the time frame to, to spend the money and develop the project is relatively short. Uh, it was also very useful in the climate and energy field to have a relatively fresh uh, national uh, climate and energy plans, which basically listed, you know, some of the investments that needed to take place and then the money came. Uh, so I think it was for us an extremely uh, positive cycle. And on that, uh, for us, the next step that we have in mind, uh, I think, goes in two directions. Uh, first, there is how are all these things implemented? Uh, and as you know, under the governance regulation, uh, member states need to report on the implementation of their NECPs. And an addition of the, of the climate law, which we all agree is a great development, uh, um, and, and today even more so, uh, an addition of the governance regulation is that that reporting will also need to look at uh, the longer term perspective and, and what it means for climate neutrality. Um, on the governance regulation, we need uh, the first uh, basically deadline for member states to report on the implementation in 2023. Uh, so we still have a bit of time also to define exactly what those reports should contain. Um, and in parallel, uh, what is also really important in terms of increased climate ambition 
uh, is that member states will need to update uh, their NECPs. This is also a requirement of the governance regulation. And this update is particularly important because this update will need basically to translate uh, the increased climate ambition of the at least 50, uh, uh, net uh, 55 emission reductions for 2030 that will need also to be translated in member states and NECPs. And for that also, we have the same cycle uh, as uh, for the first cycle, uh, draft NECPs by mid-2023 and then uh, final NECPs by mid-2024. In that context, I think uh, we, we could all uh, find, you know, bits and pieces of the governance regulation uh, that could be improved or adjusted. But I think the beauty of the governance regulation is that it's a framework which is quite well future-proof uh, and then we have, uh, it has its own uh, review cycle. Uh, a review is planned after um, the global stock take, which is uh, foreseen by the Paris Agreement in 2024. Uh, and I think at that moment, we, we can look indeed at what needs to be updated. But for me, the, the, the governance uh, regulation is, is a sort of a, a shell, you know, I mean, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's the structure uh, and basically the content and the substance come from the targets which are defined, uh, you know, in the various pieces of legislation. So it's not something, it's, it's a piece that we need stable over time, you know, because it sets, uh, you know, a very strong planning and monitoring and reporting uh, cycle. And so that's not something which is even more aligned, you know, on the, uh, on the international cycle. So it's not something that you want to change you know, uh, too quickly and, and, and too frequently. Unmute. Uh, thank you. Um, and I'm just uh, quickly checking a question that came in in the Q&A there. Um, ah, yes, we have a question from um, Vas... Vassalo uh, Savia uh, or Savia Vassalo at MRA, uh, which is that uh, we should not forget that uh, there's another crucial element, which is providing information on progress, including indicators to the general public in a way that's easy to understand and that inspires greater public action uh, in favour of climate action. Um, would you, uh, would any of you like to uh, kind of briefly comment on that, um, the, the the role of, uh, of of this sort of framework or of, of the institutions in providing that kind of information? Eduardo? Yeah. Just, just a comment. Our targets are not the easiest thing to communicate and or to understand. <laughs> Let, let's put it like that. And um, having, a, a, having the opportunity to, to have a clear communication of where we are um, is 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 obviously something that's that's crucial as as was highlighted. Um, so so yes, all all in favor of um, simplifying the message, and uh, to the extent possible, also simplifying what what we the way to deliver on on the on the on the targets. Yeah. Yeah, we see um, uh, Matthias pointing out the, the Green Deal dashboard as a concept that was at some point mentioned that might have been something that would help to, to keep track of that. Um, Cecile, I saw you unmuted. Did you want to come Yeah, in? no, I think um, I just want to echo what Eduardo was saying and, and going back to the, the, the exchanges we, we had earlier. I think it's very important when we work on something to think about the audience. Uh, because we might need, in fact, different tools with different kind of technicalities and refinement. I think with the, with the interest that we see in the general public for climate, we should indeed, as, as Sevio uh, says, it's very important that we ensure we have accessible communication. Uh, and okay, our, our most recent uh, uh, actions uh, from the Commission on that side are around the climate pact, which I think is also uh, occupying one of the missing gaps, you know, that were referred to earlier in terms of reaching out to citizens who want to do something. Um, and at the same time, uh, from the more sort of expert work that we are doing, we want this to be reliable and, and solid, but also maybe a good basis to extract information uh, which is usable by, by citizens indeed. 
I think it's very important to keep them on board. It, it would be very frustrating, uh, you know, to be doing all those efforts and to sort of miss the link uh, with the citizens uh, who are extremely interested. Yes, I, I would just, uh, I think uh, both uh, Eduardo and Cecil has said uh, the most important, but just on the very last sentence from Cecil, I think uh, this transition is huge and you have also um, uh, pointed it out uh, yourself, Erika, how big it is for uh, with the climate neutrality and where we are going. And of course, if this is to be done in, in time, we're already late, we know that, but uh, if we are going to have, have a faster uh, uh, transition, we know we need to do more now in a decade than we did in the last three decades together. Uh, so then we need to involve citizens all over in, in our union and all member states. And it is absolutely essential, uh, both for democratic reasons uh, and uh, also for, uh, for the result itself, because you can do this uh, in a very fast way, but a negative, with a negative outcome for the, uh, uh, the uh, gender equality, for uh, the whole society, for uh, also uh, the just transition. You can do it uh, in a way where some people will be very affected and negative and others will not get so hurt by it. Uh, and we all know that there are actually this transition will provide benefits for uh, us all and for our member states. We know that uh, the benefits are greater than the, than the obstacles, uh, but uh, to do it well and to do it uh, also, also socially just, then we need that interaction uh, with this society. And we will be as institutions much smarter and have better solutions if we, if we uh, involve many people in this uh, so new society that we are building. And I think Eduardo said it very well about also, actually you need to also to speak about it in a way where you can involve people and then you will get the clever solutions uh, because it becomes very technical and uh, that can also hinder many people from starting the discussion. But when people are in, then uh, of course, also the, tech, uh, the, the more technical part will be very interesting. But I mean, as a starter, you need to, to make it easy to, to be involved. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I think certainly this this uh, awareness of the need to involve citizens and engage citizens in, in the policy making and make sure that there is a, a sort of a buy in to, to the policies uh, is becoming increasingly obvious. Um, I'm going to do a shameless plug, which is that in the last couple of days, uh, a new network has been launched called the Knowledge Network on Climate Assemblies, KNOKA, um, which is a forum for bringing together um, experts and practitioners and and uh, policymakers and um, everybody with an interest in, in the idea of using deliberative democracy processes like um, climate assemblies, citizens assemblies for discussing climate, uh, whether that be at EU level or national or local. Um, so I'll put the, uh, <laughs> the link to that in the chat if you would uh, like to have a look. Um, but I would like to just um, do one, one last quick round with the same question to all of you, um, because something that sort of lies behind the work that the, the team have done with the indicators and I think is, is sort of implicit in, in some of what's been discussed here is the question of the EU long-term strategy. Um, Cecile, you mentioned that, uh, well, and national long-term strategies as well, but the question's focused on the EU one. Um, Cecile, you, you mentioned the governance regulation is sort of a, a shell or a framework where you have the substance um, and the targets being derived from the EU policies. Um, and obviously one of the, the key sort of uh, sources of information about what the level of targets and, and policies need to be is that 
comprehensive backcast planning process that the Commission did so well in 2018 with the Clean Planet for All. Um, and I think that has really been a, an instrumental and pivotal piece of work to, to where we are now. Um, the thing is, of course, uh, it, the, the 2030 target is now is now changed. So there is, to some extent, um, it, there is an outdatedness there. Um, and I'd like to ask you all, do you think uh, there would be value in having a regular update of the EU long term strategy, just as the, the national ones are supposed to be regularly updated. Um, uh, maybe I turn to you first, Eduardo, for that one. Short, an short answer will be yes. Um, definitely there's an added value, there's, a, there's an added value there, uh, as, it, as there, are, there is for the, for the national ones. Uh, we just need to be a bit aware of the role that such a document plays or, or such a strategy plays. Uh, for instance, in, in our case, we, we can see that our uh, national roadmap, there are some, some elements that are clearly outdated and that have been surpassed by, 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 by events uh, uh, subsequent. Uh, one that is not a, a small one is the advent of, of the whole hydrogen um, discussion and possibilities uh, therein that didn't exist uh, as, as, as early as 2018, uh, 2019, when we adopted our, our, our roadmap uh, and, uh, and as have since uh, encountered major developments. But still, I would, I would still say that uh, to a large extent, uh, the main conclusions of the of the roadmap and the planning for for thirty years ahead uh, still hold and continue to be relevant. Uh, and I would say that the same applies to, in the case of of the EU long term strategy. So, uh, yes, but uh, a, a call for a, a very frequent uh, update of 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 this sort of of exercises would be. Uh, a bit too much, I would say. Thank you. Um, a very uh, sensible uh, answer, <laughs> I think. Um, uh, Jutta, maybe over to you. I think Eduardo said it well, but uh, I think there is the balance. Uh, yes, uh, since uh, the technology is moving, not as fast as we, uh, in some, uh, sectors, yes, we have a very dramatic uh, improvement, others maybe not, uh, but uh, definitely uh, we know that uh, things are happening and there is always need to update uh, a bit faster in this policy area, who's now involves the whole society in a way, in a way it didn't uh, just uh, five years ago, uh, I really believe uh, it's necessary to have a more frequent updating system. That said, it's always the balance, as you always have to think very carefully, and I think the Commission will <laughs> agree to that, uh, that if there becomes uh, too often, uh, then it also misses some of its... Um, the. I'm looking for the correct word to describe it, but uh, it is also about the steering, the, the predictability, the, the, um, to be very firm and show leadership. And if you do things too often, then it loses some of the heavy, heavy feeling that it has. Uh, so that's the balance. But then to say exactly when, where, it, where you strike that balance, let's continue with more dialogue on that. Thank you. Thanks, Jutta. Um, and Cecile, maybe last word on this one. And um, I mean, hearing what the others are saying about uh, being a bit cautious about quite how often the thing is done. Nevertheless, maybe you could comment on uh, uh, whether you see a need for it to be done um, sometime soon in light of the, the, the change in the 2030 uh, ambition level. Thanks. Well, I think um, I would go back to what I was saying earlier that that in a way, I think we see that there are more important things to do, uh, you know, in the, in the next few years. And, and in particular, I'm going back to this, uh, you know, uh, update of the NECPs on the basis of the increased 2030 ambition. 
But one one reflection uh, uh, coming to my mind is that you 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 seem to link the need for update to to some elements uh, being possibly outdated or or kind of overtaken by events. And I think on that, okay, I have two reflections. One of them, I think uh, 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 Mrs. Gutterland already uh, hinted at it. Uh, you, you, I mean, by definition, when you produce a document, it's the snapshot of what you do at this point in time. Uh, so by definition, something changes. And, and Eduardo also gave an example uh, from, from the work they have done in Portugal. I think it's quite inevitable, and it's not by more frequent updates, you know, that we could completely overcome that. Uh, and indeed, too frequent update, I think, would make us lose uh, the huge benefits of what I was calling earlier the direction of travel, meaning the, the stability where we are going. Uh, if we are talking about uh, maybe a more detailed element that would be outdated, one element that I want to, to bring to the table is that, for example, in the impact assessment that we've done last September on the increased 2030 ambition, uh, the document where we basically did some new modeling compared to uh, two years before, but you can see in the impact assessment that quite a few of the results also give the 2050 results. So what I want to say is that in a way there is also a, a sort of permanent update, you know, of the underlying uh, analytical basis meaning that maybe you don't need to you know, do it in the form of the strategy, but it's important indeed that each time that we do something, uh, that we look also at the, at the longer term perspective. Uh, maybe that's an element which, which can be useful in the discussion. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And yeah, I mean, I think certainly useful to know that there, those elements of modeling are there. Um, so uh, we're slightly over time actually, so so we should wrap it up there, but I'd, I'd like to thank you very much indeed for, for, for your contributions. And I think um, what I take away overall from this discussion is that there is, uh, you know, now that we have the climate neutrality goal uh, in law, or we will have that very shortly, um, you know, that there will be a need to look again at the overall, overall, overall compass uh, and, and progress monitoring system that we're using um, and uh, you know uh, clearly there's a lot of attention on certain other processes at the moment but um, look forward to seeing uh, you know and working together to see where we can where we can make the most of the opportunities in the in the coming months anyway. Um, and uh, just to finish off with an another Mentimeter poll, just to get a snapshot of where people are at. Uh, if you wouldn't mind everybody who's still here um, and thank you for your for your patience, um, going to the uh, the link that you see there in your uh, another browser or in your phone Mentimeter. And then the, uh, the code is at the top there. And you get to also say what you take away from the event. Well done, presenters. You've done a good selling job. People want to read it. <laughs> or at least the summary. I think maybe people so much need coffee that they're, <laughs> they're not going to take part so much in the Mentimeter. But I think that's really good news that people want to want to have a look more deeply at the report. And I think um, everybody who's been involved in the project would hope uh, very much to um, continue this discussion uh, in various fora over the, the coming weeks and months, even as uh, uh, lots of attention turns at Brussels level, at least to the Fit for 55 package and uh, many other processes at national level. Um, but I think uh, it is important to take a step back from time to time and look at the, the big picture of, of how we how we track our way to, to climate neutrality overall. So uh, thank you so much to uh, to the authors, um, to the presenters, to everybody else who was involved in preparing the report um, in the different institutions uh, and designing it and project managing it and and all the rest. Um, and, and also to our panelists for your really uh, interesting contributions and uh, of course, very much to everybody for, for joining us and staying with us this afternoon um, and wish you all a very nice evening. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.